First, the opening statements, the most, more important than me. First opening statements, and we will start with um, India Walton. Thank you to the Buffalo Association of Black Journalists, WUFO, uh, the other panelists and moderators. Um, tonight, I am going to outline a bold vision for building a safe and healthy Buffalo using sound policy that is evidence-based, data-driven, and together I am excited to take on this journey with you. My life has not been much different than a typical person who grew up on the east side of Buffalo. I've survived poverty, abuse, and trauma. And that's why I'm running for mayor. I'm a registered nurse who's worked both in critical care and in Buffalo public schools. I'm an accomplished executive director of, a, of affordable housing, permanently affordable housing that was democratically led with deep community ties. And I am the endorsed Democratic nominee for mayor of Buffalo. When I'm mayor, we're going to finally tackle public safety. Violent crime is as high as it's ever been. We are going to implement data-driven, evidence-based programs that get to the root causes of violent crime. When I'm mayor, we're finally going to tackle our affordable housing crisis. We're going to stop padding the pockets of wealthy and corporate developers and put investments in our neighborhoods, making sure that we house all Buffalonians in a healthy, dignified manner. When I'm mayor, we are finally going to tackle poverty. Buffalo remains the third poorest city of its size in the country. We're going to focus on creating good, green, union wage jobs. We're going to tackle our childhood-led issues and we are going to build a safe and healthy Buffalo together. So now for our questions from our panel of journalists. First, we will have uh, Deirdre Williams asking the first question of uh, candidate India Walton. Ms. Walton, we hear defund the police, reallocate the police budget. This is all police reform, but how do you do it? What stays, what goes? And will there be enough money for police training based on how you want to reallocate funding for police? Thank you for your question. The fact of the matter is I haven't campaigned on defund the police. There's one person up here that's been defunding our community that's caused crime to run rampant over the last five years. We've been defunding community centers. We, our pools were closed this summer. We've been defunding senior and youth services. My plan is to free police to do police work which is solving crime, investigating crime, and keeping our community safe. But how specifically do you plan to do that? How do you plan to spread out the money? How do you plan to, to reallocate the budget to, make, to meet your objectives? The first thing we do is we stop police from being dog catchers, homelessness outreach, mental health counselors, and we put professionals into those roles that that is their job to do. We cut police overtime. We can end the militarization. We don't need tanks on the streets when people peacefully protest. There are lots of ways. And under a Walton administration, we're going to have a transparent budget process so that we'll be able to tackle those issues head on. Uh, this was a personal attack on India Walton. We will just say that uh, you have, Ms. Walton, you have 30 seconds to rebut uh, what the mayor just said, but there is no counter rebuttal. You have 30 seconds. The seven and a half million dollars my opponent is referencing comes from a very good study that was put out by the Partnership for the Public Good that after a great audit of the police budget suggests that positions can be eliminated through attrition and the budget can be decreased by decreasing overtime and properly staffing the police department. That's not defunding, that's a responsible use of taxpayer dollars. Thank you, thank you. Ms. Walton, would you like to answer that question? I'd love to. Um, I don't have government experience, but as I said before, I'm a registered nurse, and what I learned was that we plan, we implement, and we evaluate. And what has not happened over the last 16 years is an evaluation of how we're spending our money, where we're putting our priorities, and that needs to happen. When something isn't working, then we need change. I want to address some of the stats that have just been said. Homicide rates are up six of the last seven years. This year, the S&P actually lowered the city's financial outlook to negative, 
and Fitch downgraded our credit rating twice, most recently in 2020. Cutting taxes means that we are not funding municipal services like trash pickup and snow removal. So let's think about what's actually being said, and let's not allow the wool to keep being pulled over our eyes. Lynn, would you like to answer that question? I certainly would. Um, my last job was as founding executive director of an organization where we built permanently affordable housing in the Fruit Belt neighborhood that was higher quality than any affordable housing we've seen in the last decade. I'm very proud of that. I'm not anti-development. I am anti-development with displacement. We can do smart development that keeps neighborhoods intact, that creates mixed income neighborhoods with high quality amenities, and we can do it without draining taxpayers. If a developer wants to develop something using a tax subsidy or our tax dollars, I believe that there should be a legally binding community benefits agreement and there should be ongoing support for the surrounding neighborhoods. That, if that is what you call socialism, then sign me up. And I don't think there's too many people in this room would disagree. Let's stop mischaracterizing who I am and what I believe. Ask more questions and read more books. Um, Ms. Walton, you have 30 seconds. I would love to respond. It's amazing that in your own city you don't know what's going on. We definitely built two houses. The addresses are 162 and 166 roles. We did it in partnership with Habitat for Humanity because we secured an $800,000 grant from Enterprise Community Foundation and the city refused to let us pursue a bigger project. So we had to settle for two houses and we had to partner with Habitat for Humanity on the demand of the city of Buffalo, which you forced us to pay market rate for city-owned land to build affordable housing that serves the public good. So let's talk about that. Thank you. Ms. Walton, you have 30 seconds. We could have done much more had we had the cooperation of the city of Buffalo. That is part of the reason why I'm running for mayor because I know there are so many people who do such good work in this community and the barrier we face time after time comes from the second floor of City Hall and it's time that we end that right now. Uh, Ms. Walton, would you like to answer that question? There should be term limits. Ms. Walton, you have 30 seconds for a rebuttal. It's interesting that today, Mayor Brown wants to talk about what the rules are, since he is spending tons of money to skirt the rules. The fact of the matter is, as I said, we worked in partnership with Habitat for Humanity. We followed the rules set forth by your Office of Strategic Planning, and the state has put out an opinion paper that says you can't, in fact, dispose of land for below market rate when it's gone to use for public good. That is the that's the state's opinion on it, uh, Mr. Brown, and you should, well, you don't have to look into it anymore, but, you know, I, I want you to know that. Thank city, you. City owned land can be used to develop affordable housing, and you can't dispose of it at below market rate. Thank you, Ms. Walton. Ms. Walton. I have a comprehensive climate justice plan in my platform. I believe I'm the only person standing here that actually has a platform at all that's publicly available. We are going to establish an office of sustainability. We are going to make sure that green jobs and green energy are a priority in our administration. And we are going to rely on the experts in climate justice to make sure that climate change is ending, we're dangerously close to the tipping point, and we have to reverse that, and the city is the largest user of elect electricity and carbon emissions in the area. So we have to make sure that we're greening our fleets, switching over to electric cars, that we're making sure we're making most efficient use of our energy in city hall and city-owned buildings, and that we are recycling and composting um, as we should. Thank you. Ms. Walton, you have 30 seconds to respond. I would caution Mr. Carlisle against saying that I say things and don't do them because you don't know me and you don't know what I do. Ms. Ms. Walton, you have one minute. I believe that the mayor should have, excuse me. Glad we could answer that question. All right, uh, sorry for the interruption. We will give you uh, the full minute. No problem. Um, I don't believe the mayor should have control of this over the schools, but I do believe that the mayor's office, being one of the most influential people in the city of Buffalo, should be more involved in the decisions that are made. Um, I don't know what school district Mr. Miles' children are in, but Buffalo is definitely back in school in person. I think that we can do a better job of reducing class sizes, providing our teachers and families with the resources they need so that we have healthy learners in our school buildings. Thank you, Ms. Reporter Claudine Ewing of WGRC. And this question, uh, first answer will be from Ms. Walton. So it's uh, football time, it's Bill's season, and 
we talk about a stadium. Initial reports indicate that a new Bill Stadium will be in Orchard Park. Should it be in Buffalo? Um, and then, Mayor, when you have to answer this question, you have asked the Pagula, have you asked the Pagulas to put a dome stadium in the city of Buffalo? Should the city even propose a downtown plan that's for everyone, especially since tax dollars are going to be used for this? Ms. Walton, you're, you're first. I'm, I'm ready. One minute. Okay. <laughs> I am a Bills fan through and through. I was born and raised in Buffalo. Of course, I would love to see a stadium located within the city. However, I don't want it in a place where it displaces people. I don't want it in a place where it's going to degrade our beautiful waterfront. And I think that any taxpayer money, again, there should be a uh, legally binding community benefits agreement that doesn't create a handful of low-wage jobs, but that there's reinvestment in the surrounding community in perpetuity. Ms. Walton. It's disheartening to hear the East Side spoken about in such terms when we know that there have been systems put in place that keep certain people in a certain condition. What stabilizes neighborhoods is not buildings and renters. We have to close the racial wealth and home ownership gap. We can build infill housing, we can do it smartly, we can do it efficiently. Community land trust, I'll keep going back to it. Reuse this public subsidy and creates permanently affordable housing. I have a plan to rebuild the east side and make people feel a sense of pride in where they live. I am proud of the east side of Buffalo. I'm proud to have grown up on the east side of Buffalo. And I know that it's not our fault that things are the condition that they're in. It's the things, the resources that have not been equitably distributed in our community that's the problem. And that's how I'm going to tackle that as mayor. Uh, our next question is going to come from Taylor Epps, WKBW Channel 7, with, with a question that's not from a panel. <laughs> yes, this question is from Jeff on Twitter. He says, a chronic pl problem plaguing our city is lack of civic participation that allows corruption and voter apathy to thrive. What would you do to promote civic participation and accountability in Buffalo? Who gets that first one, Al? Um, I think it is... Ms. Walton's turn to answer that first. Oh, that question must have been meant just for me. I did shrink three inches, in case you're wondering. But I think that civic participation needs what is happening right now. We need average, everyday people to run for office. I mean, if you see the people who turn out and show up for me, they're from all age groups, all cultures, all background, all socioeconomic statuses, and all neighborhoods. I think we also need to get back into the schools and explain to our children, explain to our young adults how you get things done. People are calling me. I haven't even won yet, but people see me on TV and they say, she must be someone who can help me. Someone called my campaign phone at 10.30 at night, a couple of nights ago. There's a dilapidated house across the street from her. It's infested with rodents. She's called the city. She's called 311. She's called the Department of Health, and no one will help her. She doesn't even know where to start. We have to get our people educated, involved. When we are dissatisfied with the status quo, we have to rise up and fight, fight against it. You don't have to be a special person to do it. Just get up, please, and do it. I just want to take a moment to remind everyone that we are Jefferson and Utica. Um, activism is what allowed us to be in this room all together, sitting side by side. As far as violent crime is concerned, I'm going to give the people what they're actually asking for. Arrests are up. We're, we've taken guns off the street, and crime rates are not down. Shootings are not down. A little, a little boy was murdered this summer. People are asking for crime prevention through environmental designs. Why are there still streets that are not well lit? You know, everything doesn't have to be extra enforcement. And again, we're doing the same thing over and over again, not reevaluating and not trying anything new. It's just time for a change. And I am a leader that if we try it and it doesn't work, then guess what? We try something else. We don't keep doing what's ineffective and doesn't work. Our next question from Claudine Ewing of WGRZ. Uh, and that question will go to um, Mr. Carlisle. If you are mayor, will you raise taxes on the people? Absolutely not. Mr. Mott? Oh, no, absolutely not. We're also going to clear the arrears on the trash fee. The trash fee was supposed to be a temporary thing, and um, it's been around for 20-something years, so we need to take care of the trash fee and clear the arrears also. 
And specifically for Ms. Walton, I know when we had an interview, you talked about one day wanting to become a homeowner. It's something you want to do. How do you empathize with the people, and would you raise taxes? I do empathize, Claudine, and what I can tell you is that door after door I've knocked on, People say a modest increase in taxes, as long as we can fund city services, they're more than willing to do. Folks are confused as to why we have a city budget that relies on fines and fees to fill in the holes. Let's be real, before the American Rescue Plan was coming, we were at a $65 million deficit. We've had our rainy day fund spent down $100 million. We are not bringing in the ethical revenue to keep our city going, so unfortunately, we're gonna have to look at a modest incremental tax increase in order to balance our books. Ms. Walton, you have 30 seconds to, to respond. Fines and fees were not eliminated under the mayor's own volition. It was the Fair Fines and Fees Coalition that did that work and you were compelled to do it because the community outrage was so great that you didn't have any other choice. That is called political will. The exciting thing about me running for mayor is now people don't have to fight and scream in order for me to just do what's right. Yes, I'm going to be honest, and yes, I said it, there will be an incremental tax increase and we are going to protect legacy homeowners the same way we did with Assemblywoman Crystal People Stokes in the Fruit Belt neighborhood. You remember that, right? Ms. Walton? I would support both federal and state legislation to have stricter gun control and also hold gun manufacturers liable for illegal guns coming into our community. But I think the most important way that we reduce violent crime is by increasing resources to communities, by increasing home ownership, by reducing poverty, by creating decent living wage jobs, to, for, to give our young people something to live for, some hope for the future so that they're not out here in moments of desperation harming one another. Walton, um, you got 30 seconds. By Mike, oh, there we go. Um, I just want to clarify that what I actually said, had you listened, was that I support state and federal legislation that holds gun manufacturers liable, not that I would do it as mayor. Thank you. That's, that's, it came out of my mouth, I'm certain that's what I said. Thank you, we Mr. We can play it back later. Audience participation portion, Taylor Epps, with our next question from the audience or from online. This question is from the audience. It says, what does your first 100 days look like? Ms. Walton, you are down here as the first person to answer that question. My first 100 days looks very much like my campaign, being out in the community, meeting with community members, finding out what their wants and needs are. We're going to have to have a full audit of the city finances um, very soon because we're going to have to get into the budget and putting together a very experienced and qualified team, making sure that we're, we have the best qualified people to right our ship and get our city on the right track. Thank you. Ms. Walton, you have 30 seconds to respond. I mean, you've been mayor for 16 years. I would expect that everyone would know who you are, but the fact of the matter is that I won the Democratic primary. I'm not even sure why I'm standing up here with the three of you. Ms. Walton, you have 30 seconds. Every primary in history has resulted in the presumptive next mayor. Because it's me, you want new rules created. Yes, 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 yes. You ran as a Democrat. You used to be the head of the state Democratic Party, and now you want to create a new party for a second chance when you should have just ran the first time. Thank you, Ms. Walton. And as for the, again, as for the audience, patience on this. A question from the audience. And Taylor Epps, you can ask our next question from the audience. This question is from Roscoe Henderson. It says, I'm always interested in an individual that gives back to the community. The question is, how have you given back to the community through volunteering your time? The first to answer that is Ms. Walton. Oh, where do I start? I mean, my service in, to the community is in my blood, everything that I've done, whether it's in the pandemic, doing mutual aid, I already said that when people need help, they call me and whether it has to come out of my own pocket or whether I'm working with coalition or making referrals to other people, service is what I do, it's what I've always done, and that's what I'm gonna continue to do as Mayor of Buffalo. Thank you, Mayor Brown. Ms. Walton. I am proud, I am proud. Microphone, please. 
it's in the mic. Oh, I didn't really need the mic. But I, I, I also am proud to have a strong advocate in Albany, um, the author and, and sponsor of the MRTA, the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act. And I'm also proud to have been the Western New York lead on the campaign to legalize adult use cannabis. I have intimate knowledge of the state level law. I'm going to work very closely with the Office of Cannabis Management and make sure that licensing and zoning is done in a way that prioritizes the communities that have suffered so long from prohibition. Ms. Walton. We've heard from a variety of candidates tonight, some of whom you're meeting for the first time, and one who's had 16 years to make the changes that we need and who's failed. This is our moment. For so long, we've needed bold, competent leadership. For so long, we've needed ground up economic development, affordable housing. For so long, we've needed an effective approach to public safety. And for too long, we've needed to end corruption in City Hall. This is a once in a generation opportunity to get the change that we need. Don't let a coordinated smear and fear campaign steal that away. We have the most dedicated civil servants. City Hall employees, y'all are safe. I'm not gonna fire everybody, then what would I do? We have the most visionary community leaders and the most caring residents of any city on earth. I cannot wait to build the city that we know we all are together as the first woman to be mayor of Buffalo, New York. Vote for me November 2nd. Thank you very much.